Good afternoon and welcome to chapter nine. Chapter nine, a weather forecasting topic of the course. And this is in both the seventh and eighth edition. This video covers both chapter nine and both the seventh and eighth edition on weather forecasting. So they are the same, uh, whether you have the seventh or eighth edition. All right, so today's topic is on weather forecasting. Um, so you yourself will somewhat get to know how to use certain tools to do weather forecasting. So let's get right into the lesson today. All right, first of all, with the introduction, I'd like to say that weather forecasts are issued to save lives, save property and crops, and tell us what to expect in our own atmospheric environment. Knowing what the weather will be like in the future is vital to many human activities many interests. Uh, weather impacts us in such a great way. It impacts farmers. It impacts the travel industry, you know, transportation with buses and trains and, and planes, whether they're on time or delayed. Um, it impacts what clothes we wear. It impacts the economy, businesses, um, energy demands for electrical grids. Weather has a huge impact. Weather forecasting in general is so very important. Um, there's a lot of private forecasting consultation type um, companies out there in addition to what we're really used to and that, you know, mainly used to the uh, National Weather Service, the government weather, um, but there are also some private industry companies as well that do uh, the weather forecasting for vital areas such as construction and airlines and um, there's just so many, so many uh, impacts caused by the weather. All right, so moving on, weather, weather forecasting, this entails predicting how the present change, change or the state of the atmosphere occurs, okay? So what are we trying to do in weather forecasting? We're trying to figure out what the future weather is gonna be like. We must know the weather conditions over a fairly large area. Usually you'll see this through observing stations which are located across the world uh, they provide the forecaster with this information. You know, there's real-time forecasting data, um, and that would be like your weather satellite imagery. Um, that would also be your observations. If you're out over the ocean areas, perhaps you want to see what the wave heights and the winds are, and that's done through instrumentation such as buoys, ocean buoys. But you're really looking for real-time data. Radar, weather radar, the Doppler radar you see on your TV news, or satellite imagery like I mentioned and those observations are very critical in, in, in determining what's happening now and looking at the tendencies and the trends um, of, of the weather elements such as the barometric pressure is it rising or falling the temperatures are they getting warmer or are they getting cooler what about the cloud coverage is it increasing is it decreasing uh, winds are the winds picking up are they from a certain direction weather forecasting is very very interesting topic indeed all right, so as far as the observing stations go, there is a network out there of observing stations. Uh, we have 10,000 land-based stations, and then we also have hundreds of ships and buoys out there. As I mentioned, the buoys generally going to cover over the water, okay? Whether that be the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, uh, we have buoys that are scattered around the oceans because we really don't have the ability to get data directly from those points. They're more remote. Um, being that I was in the Navy for a while, you know, for quite some time, um, this is what we did on the ships. You know, we collected weather data on ships. So it's very important that we collect the data, get the latest observations, and that will help us determine what the forecast will be in the future. So we provide, the weather observing stations provide information at least four times a day uh, a lot of the airports, uh, they observe conditions hourly. They have something that's known as ASOS, A-S-O-S, -S, a lot of the uh, airports, A-S-O-S, ASOS, which stands for Automated Surface Observing Systems. Okay, um, That gives the airports automated data, weather observations. It allows the pilots to see what's happening at the airports prior to taking off or landing. Now, upper-level information, this can be supplied mainly by radiosons, which our instrumentation, that's instrumentation um, gathered from weather balloon launches. There's aircraft 
Uh, there's actually instrumentation on some of the aircraft, some of the airlines that collects weather data, um, even en route, en, en, en route from one location to the next. And then there's the weather satellites. All right, so acquisition, acquisition of weather information typically occurs through some of these organizations. The World Meteorological Organization is abbreviated WMO. The National Center for Environmental Prediction, NSEP, and that is uh, a supercomputing, uh, supercomputer weather center that's located up in Maryland. And it's typically, um, it's a branch of NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And then you have the National Weather Service, which we're quite familiar with. And then you have National Weather Service weather forecast offices, which do actual forecasting. So there's a, there's a couple different organizations that gather this weather information, whether it be looking at the weather satellite imagery, the observations, the Doppler radar, and they collect that data, they acquire that weather information, and then they use that in determining trends, and from those trends, they then work on a forecast. All right, so what are some of the weather forecasting tools out there available to meteorologists? Okay. We have a couple interesting ones here. I'll go ahead and go down the list here. There's the Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System, or AWIPS. Um, a lot of the National Weather Service offices now, as of 2018, the time of this recording, um, they're getting what's known as AWIPS 2, which is the next version of AWIPS. So AWIPS stands for Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System. And basically, it's a suite of computer systems um, that the National Weather Service forecasters typically have in front of them. Okay? It gives them a capability to bring up weather model data, uh, real-time data. They can look up weather observations at these AWIPS workstations. So it's a very handy tool for the National Weather Service employees. There's also Doppler radar, which we're very familiar with because we hear about, uh, we see this a lot on the evening news. Or if you wake up in the morning early and you're looking at the morning news when the TV meteorologist brings up the latest radar picture. That's usually the Doppler radar. Then you have something known as meteograms, which is basically a forecast into the future for a specific site or location. Meteograms are going to show you forecasted winds, temperature, um, barometric pressure, cloud coverage, um, chances of precipitation, where your cloud bases and cloud heights are, where your cloud layers are, are going to be determined by meteograms. I'll have uh, information on winds as well. So meteograms are, are very, very useful in, in forecasting as far as a tool. Then we also have what's known as soundings. Now soundings are associated with upper air weather balloon launches. And these typically occur um, throughout the United States at designated locations um, for the soundings. And meteorologists use these soundings. It's a vertical profile of the atmosphere. Um, what's, what's the temperature doing with height? What are the winds doing with height? Uh, what is the humidity doing? Is it increasing or decreasing as you go up in altitude with height? Um, what about the stability of the atmosphere? You know, in the next, the next week, and we get to week 10, this is week 9, uh, we get to week 10, we'll be talking about thunderstorms and tornadoes. And soundings are very important as far as severe thunderstorm forecasting. But anyway, soundings is a vertical slice of the atmosphere that tells us, um, again, how the temperature, the humidity, the barometric pressure, the winds, how that is changing with height. Okay. Uh, additionally, we have weather satellites as tools, and then we have forecast models. And you'll see a lot of the forecast models now on your TV weather. Uh, whether you're looking at the weather channel where they show a big storm possibly, you know, whether it be a hurricane or a extra tropical mid-latitude storm. They typically show you differences in the forecast models, the European weather model versus the American global forecasting system or GFS model. Okay. This image here is showing you an example of a couple forecasters. Uh, this looks like it's at the National Weather Service office, one of the forecasting offices. As they're looking at real-time data, this is one of the tools they're using. If you look at the middle picture there, they're looking at a enhanced weather satellite image. Um, no doubt they probably have this looping in motion so they can see where the clouds are moving. They can look for any kind of spin 
any kind of storm forming in the uh, cloud structure, the cloud field. Uh, they could be looking at um, the coldest cloud tops, where those are located at, because that indicates where the clouds are growing the tallest, where they have thicker clouds. So weather satellite imagery is a very, very useful weather forecasting tool, as these two forecasters or meteorologists are looking at. This is an example of a meteogram, and it shows in this particular meteogram, we're looking at uh, overall precipitation. We're looking at the precipitation on the very top bar there. Below that, we have uh, the thickness, the 1,000 to 500 millibar thickness, or how, how high the heights are in the atmosphere, or how low they are. Uh, the third little area there shows the 5,000 foot temperatures, 850 millibars is about 5,000 feet above the ground. And then there's also, we're also showing you a meteogram that depicts temperature and dew point. The uh, temperature being the, if you go to the fourth box down on this image, um, temperature is the solid red line and the dew point is that blue dash line. The closer those two are together, the greater the amount of saturation in the atmosphere and that generally indicates that we have clouds, for example, All right? possibly precipitation as well. And the very bottom box there of this meteogram shows the surface barometric pressure, um, mean sea level pressure. Uh, that red line generally indicates if, you know, the, the general on the left there, you'll see uh, the pressure range, barometric pressure from 1010 millibars up to 1030 millibars. And you'll see that red line and how it slopes down slopes down and then it kind of slopes back up to the right there showing you barometric pressure rise at the end. So a falling bar barometer and then a rising barometer. And we learned earlier in the co course that a falling barometer generally indicates a storm is moving in, lowering atmospheric pressure, and a rising barometer, rising barometric pressure indicates higher pressure or clear skies and fair weather moving in. So that's another useful tool is a meteogram. All right, so we're really going to talk a little bit more now about the computer and weather forecasting. Uh, numerical weather prediction is so big these days. Um, meteorologists and forecasters, um, whether in the private sector, in the military, um, in universities, or if you're doing National Weather Service work with the government, this is a big one nowadays. TV meteorologists use it all the time. You see there are colorful graphics on the news. Um, what they look at for numerical weather prediction is the analysis is first and what the analysis is 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 a current state of the atmosphere so if i'm looking at a weather chart what is happening right now okay so the analysis is that final surface and upper air chart numerical weather prediction takes these complex mathematical equations these omega equations and they crunch all those model, all that mathematical equation, all that mathematical jargon, and compress it down into a forecast via numerical weather maps. Um, there'll be graphical maps showing you different variables in the atmosphere. And numerical weather prediction is used for daily forecasting. Atmospheric model, that is another example of weather forecasting tool. We talk about computer and weather forecasting, uh, describes the present state of the atmosphere. And then data assimilation, that's part of the numerical weather prediction process. That's where all the data that's ingested. So you have, with numerical weather models, you have a lot of information that gets ingested or input into numerical weather models. We talked about the, earlier about the weather observations, about the buoy information, the ship reports out of the open water. All those observations get sent in and then eventually ingested into numerical weather models, forecast models, and that helps increase accuracy. The more detailed and more accurate those observations that are fed into the numerical weather forecasting models, the more accurate these typically are. So when we talk about data, uh, data assimilation, we're talking about the process of integrating data into those numerical models. All right, and then we talk about what's known as a prog chart. Sometimes a meteorologist might talk about a prog chart. And this is the final forecast chart representing the atmosphere at a specified future time. So for example, let's say you're doing a 12 hour forecast. We call that 12 hours into the future, right? 12 hour forecast. 
We would call that a 12-hour prognostic chart or prog chart. We can look at 24 hours out in time, 36 hours into the future, 48, and so on. Five days, 10 days, seasonal. Um, but just realize that taking in all the, the data, looking at the numerical uh, weather models, this is generally going to produce what's known as a prog chart, which is a forecast chart in the future. The resolution is very important as far as numerical weather prediction. Resolution refers to the distance between the grid points. So if the grid points are really, really close together, that generally indicates we have higher resolution, which is a good thing. We want higher resolution to have the most accurate numerical weather model data. Okay? If those grid points are spaced much further apart, we have what's called lower resolution. Lower resolution means there's going to be a lot of gaps in between grid points. So something can be missed rather easily when it comes to a certain weather variable that is very important to a weather forecast. So with lower resolution, we typically have less accurate weather forecasts in the future. All right, so why computer-based forecasts can go awry and steps to improve them? Numerical weather models are not perfect. They do have inherent flaws in, in them. Um, you really have to, as a forecaster over time, you typically learn this stuff with experience. Okay, um, you know, just, just from my experience, looking at numerical model data, um, I generally knew what to trust as far as the model output. When you look at a, for example, the American GFS model versus the European model, um, European weather model has biases uh, that, just like the American GFS model, they both have biases. But the European model tends to have a better track record as far as tracks of cyclones or tracks of hurricanes. In fact, Hurricane Florence earlier this year, the European weather model had Florence approaching the Carolinas and then making a sharp left-hand turn, which I myself thought, wow, that's totally against the laws of physics here. But it was the first one to show that, the European numerical model, and it was the most accurate overall with the track. Um, GFS model, the American GFS model, it tends to overdo precipitation amounts typically. It tends to be too wet. So there are specific flaws in computer models. There's certain inherent biases. Like I said, with the GFS model, it tends to generally be too wet. It might tend to deepen or strengthen a storm too soon. Whereas the European model, it has a really good track record in picking up the overall macro scale flow. The majority of models are not global in coverage, okay? So you have really, like, the GFS and the European model, those are global models. But you also have smaller scale models as well. Now, with global models, you cannot pick up the small scale features. What do I mean by that? Uh, for example, if I was looking at a global weather model in the summer along the Gulf Coast and... You know, since it's global, its resolution isn't the highest. You know, it's fairly rough or coarse resolution, uh, lower resolution, like I just mentioned. It may miss that land sea breeze front. They might miss that, those thunderstorms caused by a sea breeze because it can't see to that fine of a scale. So global weather models do have their flaws, and this is one of them. They cannot pick up on smaller scale features such as thunderstorms caused by summertime heating due to a sea breeze or thunderstorms over a heated mountain slope. They just won't pick that up. Uh, that's why we have even smaller scale models known as mesoscale weather models. And those mesoscale models help to pick up on some of those smaller details. You know, valley breezes, mountain breezes, sea breeze, land breeze, stuff like that. Now, there's other issues with global forecast models because there's sparse observations in some regions. Over oceans and high altitudes at the highest peaks of the world, of some of the tallest mountains in the world, there just is, there's no weather observing stations up there. Um, we do have buoys over the oceans, but they still are fairly you know, spread apart to a certain degree over a pretty good distance. So the grid spacing in numerical weather models, when I talk about numerical weather models, the grid spacing is that distance between grid points. Okay. Now, improvements are always being worked on with numerical weather models. Okay. Um, 
they're now starting to work on decreasing or making the distance between those grid points smaller and smaller and closer together because that will allow them to capture smaller scale weather features. Those grid points, if you, if you put a lot more grid points on a, on, on, a, on a piece of paper, for example, you're going to be able to cover a lot more data as compared to when they're much further apart. Many computer models cannot adequately interpret many factors that influence surface weather, such as the interactions of water, ice, surface friction, and local mountainous terrain on weather systems. All right, those global models just are, the grid points are too far apart, they just miss some of those smaller details. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about ensemble forecasts now as a weather forecasting tool. When some ensemble forecasting is starting to get a little bit more popular these days with meteorologists and forecasting. Ensemble forecasts are based on running several forecast models or different versions or simulations of a single model, each beginning with slightly different weather information to reflect the errors inherent in the measurements. And the result of an ensemble forecast is what's known as a spaghetti plot. You may have seen this on uh, the weather TV meteorologists talking about on the news when they bring up a, a map on their TV display where it shows all the different colored tracks for example of a tropical system a hurricane um, it'll have a, like a whole bunch of different color lines that is an example of a spaghetti plot it's all kinds of different forecast models um, they all have different initial conditions with ensemble forecast that's really what it's about uh, ensemble forecasts go back to Edward Lorenz, who came up with what's known as the chaos theory. Um, basically, Edward Lorenz determined that a butterfly, by a butterfly flapping its wings, it can cause these little ripple effects in the atmosphere. Something as simple as a butterfly flapping its wings. All right, And that chaos that's created by those little ripples or little um, changes or undulations in the, in the atmosphere that can actually cause the weather to go completely be what we call chaos, chaotic, okay? So the whole goal with ensemble forecasting is to start the forecast model process off with different initial conditions. And then from those initial conditions at the beginning of the model forecast, the numerical weather run, that will give you different results. And those different results are then looked at by meteorologists and they're grouped into confidence levels. So, for example, on a spaghetti plot, if I'm showing a whole bunch of different weather models, if those weather models are fairly close together, then as a forecaster or a meteorologist, I have a lot higher confidence in that forecast. If those all those weather models, all my ensemble members are close together, I have a higher sense of confidence in my forecast compared to if my ensemble model runs are much further apart, all those ensemble members, each individual forecast is much further apart, then my confidence is not as great. So let me show you an example of that. Here's an example of an ensemble uh, weather forecast, okay? Now, the red and the aqua color lines represent um, different heights in the atmosphere, okay? Um, the kind of like that bluish aqua color that represents the 5460 meter height line uh, and where that would be at um, we're looking at a map of the northern uh, northern hemisphere overall and the uh, reddish pink color there indicates the height of 56 um, it looks like a little bit lower than that 5640 meters okay and then the yellow line represents the average of all the ensemble uh, forecast members or all the ensemble runs all set with different initial conditions. The green indicates, there's a green line in there too that indicates your typical climatology or the average position of these height lines in on a weather chart. All right, so overall, my, uh, you know, the closer the red and those aqua color lines are to each other, the closer they are, the higher the confidence in the forecast of where those specific heights would be in the atmosphere. So if the lines are close to each other, the aqua colored there, and then that the, uh, the red line, if they're closer to, together, that generally indicates fairly good agreement in the ensemble forecast. Okay? And that indicates a higher degree of forecasting confidence. 
the further apart these lines are from each other, now you can see that over the United States, here's an example of a lower confidence forecast with an ensemble. The red line is dipping down into Texas, whereas the, the aqua color line is way over, it's to the northeast of quite a distance um, over Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky. So there's a big difference or a big gap in distance between the um, aqua color lines and that red line indicating that trough, the position of upper air trough. And so my confidence would be much less over that particular time period in that particular location. All right, now we're looking at a, uh, this is almost like a, uh, just a graphic showing you an ensemble forecast, okay? Um, this is for a snowstorm in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, if you notice at the bottom left there, okay, there's a bunch of different lines there, and they're almost like they're on top of each other. So the initial forecast for this storm, and we were, what we're looking at here is a forecast for snowfall amounts. If you look at the y-axis on the left, it ranges from zero all the way to 60 inches of snow, okay? You'll notice the high confidence, the closer these lines are together, the more closely or tightly packed these lines are, the greater the forecast confidence. And typically with meteorology, with ensemble forecasts, the further out we get in the forecast period, the more widely spaced these ensemble forecast members are gonna be, and the less the confidence is gonna be. So our forecasts have got much better. Three to five day forecasts now are much more accurate today as compared to 10 years ago, okay? Beyond five days, especially beyond seven days now, um, the weather forecasting, the ensemble, the uncertainty, the, the lower confidence really comes into play. All right, other forecasting techniques that meteorologists use would be what's known as a persistence forecast. What does that mean? What is happening today will continue to happen tomorrow. That's all a persistence forecast is. Um, persistence forecasts can be very handy, especially in tropical regions, for example. Um, if you've ever been to Hawaii, it's fairly uh, persistent, the weather there, with uh, northeast trade winds. Um, so generally what you'll see is partly cloudy with uh, isolated showers for forecasts out in Hawaii. Um, so outside the mid-latitudes, the, the persistence forecast works really well because you really don't have much change in temperature. You really don't have much change in the overall uh, weather forecast with precipitation. Um, unless you have like a hurricane coming in, in the tropics, then obviously that would be a big change. But outside of that, it's fairly persistent. Persistence forecast. What's happening today, you predict again will happen tomorrow. Steady state or trend forecast. Very similar, um, but with steady state or trend, what we're looking at is past forecasts. For example, if I have an area of lower pressure or a storm system over, let's say, Southern California, and... It is moving at 15 miles per hour to the northeast. Um, generally, then I would go on, a, I would look at a weather chart. I would plot the current position of that storm system in Southern California. And then I would say, okay, well, it's moving 15 miles per hour. So in 12 hours, based on that continued speed or steady state, the area of low pressure or storm will now be in New Mexico in 12 hours. And then if I continue to assume it's going to move at 15 miles per hour, let's say, you know, 24 hours out from now, it's in North Texas. So steady state is basically things continue to move at the same speed in the forecast period. The analog method, that's simply looking back at past historical uh, weather patterns. We look at analogs. We look at past weather patterns, and we try to connect the dots in predicting the future forecasts. This is especially a method that's used in long-range weather forecasting analogs. Um, you look at past historical weather. Uh, let's say like last winter uh, was, was very cold, and we noticed that there was a certain upper air trough over a certain portion of the United States. Uh, we also noticed that there were warmer water temperatures off the West Coast, and maybe we connect the dots and say, okay, well, when, there, when there's very warm waters over, off the West Coast, then we'll have a colder than normal winter in the East. That's the analog method. It's looking at past weather charts, past weather patterns, and trying to determine long-range forecasting using the past. Statistical forecasts are just that. That's just 
based on statistics? Um, what are the probability or likelihoods of things happening? An example of a statistical forecast could be a precipitation forecast. Uh, probability forecast, we definitely, we definitely use a probability of precipitation. Uh, the Weather Service typically is called POP or POP, probability of precipitation. Um, that's the probability that you will see rain or maybe it's snow, some sort of precipitation in your area. That is an example of a probability forecast. Weather types prediction, um, that's really just determining what type of precipitation you would typically get in your area. Uh, as an example of this type of uh, prediction, it would be, you know, the 540 decameter line generally indicates your rain, snow line in winter for the eastern United States, the central and eastern United States, east of the Mississippi River. So you would use the um, 540 line in this case and weather types prediction as your rain, snow line. Anybody to the north of that 540 height line would be in the snow. Anybody south or located south of that line would be in rain. And then climatological forecasts. And climatology, we take into account 30 years of data to determine what is normal for an area. What is my normal temperature for today's date? You'll see this on TV meteorology too. Uh, on TV, when TV weathermen go up there, they talk about um, today's normal high is 48 degrees. Today's normal low is 32. And then they'll compare today's actual high and low how above or below normal, how much above or below normal that is compared to the climatological forecast. So climatological forecast really is what normally should be happening at a specific time of the year. All right. So here is an example of a probability uh, forecast. Um, this here is showing you the probability of, this is actually the probability of a white Christmas, believe it or not. Okay. So you can see that the purple colors are indicating 75 to 90% up in the northern United States. See those purplish colors there, the darker purple? The white areas means there's a greater than 90% chance of a white Christmas. And that would be over northern Minnesota, northern Michigan, into upper New York State, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, into the mountains of the west where your higher elevation is colder. But then you look further south in that lighter green color, there's only a 10 to 24% chance of a white Christmas and then less, even less than that, basically from about uh, 36 degrees north latitude uh, down, down south, all the way down to the Gulf Coast and the southern states. So this is an example of a probability forecast. What is the probability of a white Christmas in the United States? All right, so um, this is some of the wording I'm going to show you here. This is table 9.2. This would be table 9.2 in your Aaron's, uh, this would be your 8th edition textbook. Forecast wording used by the National Weather Service to describe the percentage probability of measurable precipitation. And what does the Weather Service consider measurable? It's 1 100th of an inch or greater, 0 0.01 or greater for steady precip and for convective showery precip. So this table is just showing you you know, what it, What do they consider slight? Have you ever seen that in the National Weather Service forecast? They say a slight chance of rain showers. That means it's a 10 to 20% probability of it happening. If they say there's a chance of rain, right, or they, they use the term scattered, scattered showers, that's a 30 to 50% chance of precipitation. And then if they say precipitation likely the Weather Service, that means there's numerous showers in the area and that's a 60 to 70% probability of precipitation. And then if they just say precipitation, rain or snow, um, the wording might be showers. That means there's 80% probability of precipitation. So if you look at the bottom here below the table, a forecast that calls for an 80% chance of rain in the afternoon might read like this, cloudy today with rain this afternoon. So they have a high confidence that rain's gonna happen they put up an 80% probability of it happening, okay? Um, the 60% chance of rain does not apply to a situation that involves rain showers. So just realize this, all I really want you to get out of this slide is the National Weather Service uses different wording in their forecast discussions, in their actual weather forecasts, and that's based on the, again, the probability of precipitation. Um, sometimes you'll hear the acronym POP, P-O-P. Um, other tools that you can look at, this is, now this is the analog 
this is the analog forecasting method. Um, this is showing you typically what would happen in the winter time. Okay, so if you get this, it's been de it's been determined by past weather charts that if you get this huge upper air ridge, this huge upper ridge over the western United States into western Canada, typically in the atmosphere, what goes up must come down. So downstream of that upper ridge, you get this deep upper trough, and that usually leads to cold polar air outbreaks, um, especially from the Mississippi River, Midwestern U.S., all the way to the East Coast. Um, and then analog methods would also look at the position of the high pressure system there over the west, Western U.S., and if it's over the Great Basin area, you typically get what's called a Santa Ana wind over Southern California, where the the air is coming down the canyons, the Santa Ana canyons of Southern California as the air comes down the slopes of those um, Santa Ana mountains. The air compresses, it warms, it dries out. And they typically get pretty pretty uh, warm out there in Southern California when you've got that high pressure system sitting over the Great Basin. The clockwise flow around it, producing northeast winds, offshore winds into Southern California. So this is an example of analog forecasting methods, looking at past weather patterns and trying to determine what the future holds for weather forecasts. All right, so now we're going to talk about time range of forecasts. All right, there's types of forecasts out there. We have the nowcast, which is out for a few hours, usually under six hours. And under nowcast forecast, there's usually associated with those uh, what's known as a weather watch, a weather warning, and a weather advisory. Then you have short range weather forecasts, which are usually 12 hours to a few days. Medium range weather forecasting is three to eight days in the future. Long range forecasting is beyond eight days. And then seasonal outlooks, these are three month periods that overlap and extend out to roughly one year. Seasonal outlooks are typically um, completed by the Climate Prediction Center, which is a branch of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Okay, so here's an example um, on the left. Okay, so we're showing you a climate outlook on the left for June through August of 2014. We're showing you precipitation uh, outlook on the left. And on the right-hand chart, I'm showing you temperature outlook. And this is running from June through August 2014. Um, generally on the left, you see the green area with the A. A indicates above normal precipitation, that green area on the left-hand chart. That B on the Gulf Coast in the Texas, Louisiana indicates below normal precipitation. Now look over on the image on the right for the temperatures. A indicates above normal temperatures. And then the blue shading and the B there in the upper Midwest indicates below normal temperatures. So that is, this is a great example of a uh, forecast that's a little bit longer range, out to 90 days. Now the accuracy and skill in weather forecasting, um, the National Weather Service forecast accuracy, usually in that 12 to 24 hour range is usually quite accurate. Uh, skill is more accurate than a forecast based only on persistence or climatology. Weather forecasts ranging from 12 hours to a few days generally show much more skill than persistence forecasts. Well, and, and the reason that is is because with persistent forecasts, you are assuming that conditions will continue to remain the same. Um, for example, again, I go back to that example about the, the storm system moving at 15 miles per hour. If you assume that that thing is going to move 15 miles per hour over the next five days, there's a good chance that's not going to happen because there's going to be some other external influence or force acting on that storm system. So the skill is much more accurate than a forecast based only on that persistence or even climatology. The best forecasts incorporate a multiple atmospheric layers using numerical modeling. Um, this just comes over with time and experience for a forecaster. Uh, the forecaster will generally learn the weather models pretty good. He'll know, he or she will know what to be looking for. Um, a forecaster also needs a strong sense of how surface features typically evolve. Um, so numerical weather prediction is simply guidance. But really where it really comes in, where the rubber meets the road for a forecaster or meteorologist is their experience at a particular location forecasting the weather. If they see weather models showing something 
Um, but they know deep down inside that's not usually the way things work at their location. That just, again, comes with experience and time. Okay. So weather forecasting using surface charts, um, determining weather system movement. Generally, here's some rules of thumb for weather system movement, okay, using surface charts. The mid-latitude cyclones move in the same direction and speed as the previous six hours, typically. Low pressure areas or storm systems, those cyclones, they move in a direction parallel to the isobars in the warm air ahead of the cold front. Um, so low pressures typically move towards the east-northeast to the northeast in the northern hemisphere. Lows move toward the regions of the greatest pressure drop. Um, there is something that's known as isalabar. An isalabar is a line of equal pressure change. Low pressure systems seek the path of least resistance and generally move towards the greatest pressure falls. And surface pressure systems tend to move in the same direction as the wind up at 18,000 feet in the atmosphere. So there's some good rules of thumb to use when weather forecasting using surface charts. Okay, so here is a surface chart itself. I'm just showing you what it looks like. You have an area of lower pressure in this particular image situated over northeastern Kansas with a warm front draped southeastward from it down into Mississippi, um, into the Gulf of Mexico. And then you have a cold front that extends southwestward from that low pressure system into uh, eastern Oklahoma, the Texas Panhandle, into New Mexico, Arizona, out into even all the way out to Nevada. So um, the dashed lines generally indicate uh, where the where those fronts were 24 hours prior. And so you can see that warm front generally moves to the east. The cold front's generally dropping from northwest to the southeast. The area of lower pressure is starting to move east-northeast. It's going to go towards the greatest pressure falls. It's going to go also, low pressures are going to move towards the strongest warm air. All right, so let's look at a forecast for six cities, and we're going to look at the weather forecast for Augusta, Georgia, Are we gonna, we're going to look at determining whether there's rain or snow for Washington, D.C., um, whether there'll be a big snowstorm for Chicago, a mixed bag of weather for Memphis, a cold wave for Dallas, and clear but cold for Denver. So let's take a look at the forecast for six different cities. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is look at the weather chart here. Uh, we can see the general forecasted track here of that red L, or that low pressure system. Starting out over northeast Kansas, it moves into central Illinois, just south of Chicago, in 12 hours. And then it moves over Lake Erie in 24 hours. Um, you can see the areas, the, the, the fronts, and how they're moving as well. Uh, generally, the progression of, of where we're expecting the, the low pressure to move uh, as well as a high pressure system that's back behind over Wyoming uh, into Colorado, okay? So let's see. All right, and then this is what actually really happened, okay? So if you look back here, look at your forecast where that low pressure ends up at 24 hours. It travels from northeast Kansas into Lake Erie area, and generally the forecast model, the numerical weather model, moved a little too quick. But you can see where the low pressure ends up being. It ends up being over northern Indiana, just slightly to the southwest of the forecast position. But in general, you still had a good little snowstorm there for Chicago. Uh, that white color indicates snowfall. The pink indicates a mix of rain and snow. Perhaps there's ice in there. And then the green area indicates areas of liquid precipitation or rain. So you can see in this image, Washington, D.C., a very chilly cold rain at 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, even down into Augusta, Georgia, it's only 48 degrees Fahrenheit with a cold rain. Okay, but Chicago on the back side of the storm has snow with a temperature of 24 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. So what will tomorrow's weather be like? Will it be similar to today's or will it change markedly? Okay, you can look at the 500 millibar chart. That'll be a useful tool to look at. Um, that's at 18,000 feet. 500 millibars is basically another way to say 18,000 feet above the ground. The models provide assistance, um, a valid forecast. That's a very important thing to look at is a valid forecast. You can look at a satellite and upper air charts, okay? And then you can look at 
Um, using that data, you can determine if it'll be a day of rain and wind. Okay. All right, so when we look at a weather forecast and look at tools to use, we have to look at all dimensions or all levels in the atmosphere. Um, you have to look in a three-dimensional view, okay? And that's what this uh, particular image is showing you. Um, you need to look up at 30,000 feet above the ground. That's where your jet stream is located. Um, you need to take a look at the five, uh, 500 millibar, 18,000 foot level to determine if you have a shortwave trough or a shortwave ridge moving into the area. You need to take a look at the 5,000 foot level, 850 millibars. That's going to determine the type of temperature changes you may expect whether it's colder air moving in or warmer air moving in. And then you go all the way down to the surface, the ground where we live, and you know what kind of precipitation is falling. Is there any kind of elevated warm layers that might change snow to rain? Um, that's really where we're going to see the weather, obviously, where we live here at the ground. But you've got to look at everything from the ground all the way up to the jet stream level at 30,000 feet above our heads and really putting together a really good weather forecast using the forecasting tools. So on this image we're showing uh, this is the surface chart. This is what we have going on on a surface chart. Okay, so we have an area of lower pressure over New Mexico. Looks like another area of lower pressure as indicated by the red L over Washington or Oregon. Um, you have a stationary front uh, indicated by the alternating blue triangle line and then that red semicircle. Okay. Higher pressure over Canada by the blue H, indicated by that blue H. That's the surface map. This is the 500 millibar chart. This is what's going on. These are the surface weather features, right? This is what's going on at 18,000 feet above those surface features. So in this image, we're showing a upper air trough, which is situated off of the west coast of the United States. So your upper level height lines are getting, they're getting less and less as colder air moves into the base of this long wave trough. Okay, um, you do have a couple upper air features. You have upper level low over in the base of that long wave trough, that big dip there in the jet stream. Um, you also have another area of lower pressure indicated by the purple L over Western Canada, over British Columbia. So that's at 18,000 feet, 500 millibars. Now let's take a look at the prognostication or forecast of 500 millibars or 18,000 feet. So the upper air trough there, model A on the left, uh, the upper air trough, the axis remains off the west coast. In that middle diagram there, uh, model B, um, a little bit deeper, but um, still remaining off the west coast of the United States. And then in model C, the 24-hour prog for that, lo that particular model, uh, much different. Um, the trough is not as deep, and the upper level low pressure system is situated off of Washington State. So there are some subtle differences here in the model data at the 18,000 foot level or 500 millibar forecast. Okay. Um, this is showing you again what's going on at the surface, and this is what's showing what's going on at 500 millibars or 18,000 feet one more time. Okay. This is what's going on on the satellite image. As I mentioned earlier on in the lesson, it's very essential that you utilize your real-time data. Real-time data being your satellite imagery to kind of see what's actually happening. All right, Your analysis is such a key part to a good weather forecast. You really got to make sure looking at the satellite imagery, looking at your weather observations. You got to take all of this, if you're looking at forecasting over the marine environment or water you got to look at the ocean buoys, determine what the pressure is, determine what the winds are, determine what the wave heights are at, what, how high is the ocean waves at that point, and the buoys. Okay, The analysis is such a key part because if you have a bad analysis with any kind of weather, numerical weather product, using numerical weather prediction, using weather forecast models, if there's a bad analysis and things are not matching up right, then the amount of error will just continue to increase into the future of that model. Okay. And then looking at, so if we were to compare the satellite image, we see there's a comma-shaped cloud over the eastern Pacific. Okay, now let's look at the um, jet stream level. At 300 millibars is 30,000 feet above our heads. All right, so there's an area of higher jet stream winds indicated by this pinker, you see the pink color here in the center? It's almost like an elongated football shape. That's what's known as a jet maximum. 
um, in the base of that trough. And if we look at the satellite image, usually you'll see a secondary little area of brighter clouds indicating what's known as a vorticity maximum. And that usually is an association with this higher stream of air into the trough they're associated at the jet stream level, the, these colors here. These are faster blowing wind speeds. Whenever you get faster blowing wind speeds, um, you get some sort of lifting mechanism in the atmosphere. Now let's take a look at the radar image. Oh yeah, it's looking pretty, pretty rainy in California, especially in San Francisco on this particular day, San Jose down to Monterey. Just in general, Central California is getting hit pretty good. Um, but you would look at this chart and see where this upper level low is at in, 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 uh, in relation to these radar returns. So if I were to actually have the ability to loop this radar image, I might see a little bit of a cyclonic spin with the radar imagery here with all the, the reflectivity and the moisture that's getting wrapped into the, around this uh, area of lower pressure in the upper levels. Right. And then this is showing you a surface weather map of what's going on. So that does match up fairly well with our radar image, okay? Um, judging by the pattern here, I believe that the area of low pressure would be generally in this area. That's what I'm seeing based on the signature. It almost looks like this is a comma area here. The backlash of moisture on the back side of this area of low pressure or storm system. And then I look at the surface chart, that matches up pretty well. We have a pretty, uh, uh, a pretty strong storm system off central California at this point, on this particular day and image. 993 millibar low. Now, normal atmospheric pressure is 1013 millibars. So um, you're looking at, you know, about a 20 millibar uh, below normal for a, a barometric pressure on this particular day with this area of lower pressure. All right. So there's a lot of things you have to take into account when doing weather forecasting. I'm hoping you really get that out of this particular lesson. Forecasting tomorrow's weather entails a variety of techniques and methods. In the short range, persistence usually works fairly well, um, especially in the summertime across the United States when <clears throat> there's not much change, or in the tropics as I talked about earlier. Surface maps are always good to use for short range forecasts. Satellite imagery is your real time data as well as your Doppler radar. Is there any precipitation showing up on the radar, the Doppler? <clears throat> Short and medium range forecasts, you want to look at the current analysis. That's a very important piece. Satellite data, pattern recognition. The meteorologist intuition, it comes into play. Um, that's just with time and experience, like I've mentioned a couple times in this uh, lesson. Um, over time, you just get to, you get to really look at weather patterns, where storms are at, where your jet stream's at. Uh, where's your disturbance <clears throat> up at 500 millibars or 18,000 feet? Experience is just so critical in, in producing a really good forecast, and that just takes time and practice. And then there's monthly and seasonal long-range forecasts. The changes in sea surface temperature, for example, you know, here's an example, El Nino. Okay, <clears throat> Whenever you have El Nino, you typically have a specific um, type of winter weather in the United States, for example. Okay. Seasonal outlooks by the Climate Prediction Center is another example of uh, seasonal long-range outlooks. All right, that wraps things up today on the lesson on weather forecasting. Just realize one thing, that weather forecasting is challenging. It's also an art. Um, you have to really utilize all the tools at your disposal. And you can pretty much get any of these tools these days on the Internet. I mean, anybody could. You could go on and, and, you know, if you want to look at upper air soundings um, for weather balloon launches, you could go to the University of Wyoming. Um, you can go, there's a couple really good, uh, with GO-16 imagery, there's a couple really good sites to look at weather satellite imagery. Kind of see where the clouds are now. Where are they moving in a time lapse or animated satellite image? Um, you know, look at your all your levels in the atmosphere. If there's one thing I really want you to get out of this lesson, it's, Weather is, to do accurate and, and a really good skilled weather forecast, you've got to be looking at all levels of the atmosphere, from the ground all the way up to the jet stream. So from the surface all the way up to 30,000 feet above the ground, you really have to take a look at those, um, all those levels, okay, to really produce a really good forecast. Uh, you just don't have weather happen at one level. Weather is impacted by upper air features as well. 
And so I hope you really enjoyed this lesson on weather forecasting. Um, the weather forecasting is getting better. Numer numerical model data, numerical weather prediction is getting better. Um, although we did talk about the grid points, um, you know, the, the, more, the global models generally have much widely spaced grid points. So they don't catch the smaller detail items like thunderstorms or land sea breezes. Um, the resolution just isn't high enough to catch it. But, uh, I really hope you enjoyed the lesson on weather forecasting. Please feel free to ask me questions. Send me an email if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. I've got a lot of experience doing weather forecasting um, over my time with the Navy. All right. Thank you for being an attentive listener, and I really hope everybody is having a great day wherever you are. Take care, and um, we'll talk to you again soon.